graduates, parents, other family members, Institute faculty, and uh, distinguished guests. Uh, let me begin by offering my heartfelt congratulations to all of you. INSEAD is such a great uh, business school, and I do confess to have special knowledge about at least one of your graduates, uh, several actually, um, who I know well. And if there are indi any indication of the rest of you, I have full objectivity when I say to you, of all classes to graduate from this esteemed institution, this surely must be the most distinguished. So I really so Now, it's usually the job of convocation speakers to give us solid mot motivational advice on how to be successful and to have a happy life. So let me dispense with that task quickly. Today is the first day of the rest of your lives. Work hard, nothing comes easy. The rule goes to those who show up, not those who are asked. Be prepared to fail and learn from your failures. Turn lemons into lemonades. Follow your dreams, but have balance in your life. And oh, on a practical level, Always use sunscreen, never wear a bad fitting suit, and be sober when you come along. Thank you. I hope you're fully motivated and inspired. Um, however, today I have a different goal, actually. Uh, for starters, you don't need advice on how to succeed in this business. Every one of you is already enormously accomplished. You succeeded as undergraduates. You've each done something important in the workforce. You've gone through the grueling process of business school standardized testing and the applications marathon. Uh, you've triumphed by being admitted to one of the best schools in the world, maybe the best. And in the last year, you've mastered one of the toughest curriculums anywhere. And yes, from what I can tell, you've also mastered an intense and deeply stimulating travel and social program. Um, my wife Anna and I are actually looking forward to experiencing our first chateau party to see what all the fuss is about. <laughs> so now that you prepare for the next phase of your life, many of you have already scored prime jobs or are launching hopeful new ventures. So by all means, uh, use your enormous smarts, your knowledge, your pedigree, your connections to prosper. Live long and prosper, as Spock would have said. But today I'd like to try and convince you that the world needs more from you. Your generation, and this class in particular is the cream of the crop, is being called upon to bring about some important, even historic changes in business, government, and society. In fact, I'm convinced that we're on the threshold of nothing less than a new era of human civilization. And your generation has got the job of ushering it in. Let me explain. If you stand back and look at the world, this class is graduating at a very important time in history. It's a time of, of great upheaval, of uncertainty, and of danger. But fundamentally, it's a time of renewal, of rebirth, and possibilities. Sure. Uh, if you look at the world today, it's no revelation to you that my generation is handing you a bit of a mess. Sorry about that. Sovereign debt crisis in Europe, the weird Great Recession that keeps double dipping and refusing to end. Youth unemployment everywhere is, is astronomical. Many refer to a jobless recovery. That's an oxymoron if I ever heard of one. The gap between rich and poor is growing in many parts of the world. Uh, of the world, including Europe and the United States. And the world is too unstable, it's too unequal, and it's unsustainable. At an annual uh, meeting at uh, Davos, of the World Economic Forum last year, uh, Bill Clinton gave a group of us some evidence about climate change. He said that if we reduce carbon emissions by 80% in the year 2050, not by 6%, by 80%, It'll take a thousand years for the planet to cool down, and in the meantime, some bad things will happen. We can expect a billion and a half people to lose half of their water supply in the next 10 to 20 years. So further, politicians can't get to see, they, they, they just can't seem to get things done. Leaders of institutions everywhere have lost trust. And who would have imagined four years ago that today, in 2012, 
A big theme of business books and management articles and publications would be how to save capitalism. Or is capitalism even savable? And many economists are predicting a depressed, volatile global economy. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, yikes, what a downer. I mean, why couldn't I be in the graduating class where Stephen Colbert or Woody Allen was a convocation speaker? But my message to you uh, actually is a good news story. And we can all be enormously hopeful about the future. And why? Well, I'm of the view that the future is not something to be predicted. It's something to be achieved. And we can achieve a very different future than the one that the economists are describing. But to do this, we need to understand what the problem is. And the problem doesn't fall within the paradigm of traditional thinking. Economists worry about business cycles. This is not a cyclical change that we're going through. Rather, it's a secular one. Arguably, the industrial age is finally running out of gas. I mean, many of the institutions that have served this well for decades, even centuries, have kind of uh, come to the end of their life the old financial services industry, old models of government, healthcare, newspapers, the media, our institutions for global problem solving like the UN are all struggling. At the same time, enabled by the digital revolution, humanity is beginning to reinvent these institutions around a new set of principles. Principles of, of collaboration, of openness, of interdependence, of integrity. And everywhere, you can see the contours of all kinds of new models for prosperity, social development, for a just world, and for a new kind of civilization. I mean, networked approaches to innovation are replacing traditional models. Despite the economic mess, entrepreneurship is growing rapidly around the world, largely because the internet enables little companies to have all the capabilities of big companies without the main liabilities. We're transforming healthcare with patients like me, 100,000 patients crowdsourcing their data to help doctors, scientists, and their own course of treatment. With Galaxy Zoo, 275,000 students and amateur astronomers are, are helping discover new galaxies and helping the, the, um, the uh, uh, astron uh, astronomers do that. Communities like Kickstarter, raising funds for entrepreneurs with traditional venture capitalists can. Teachers, professors, students are using the internet to reinvent education from an old industrial model where students are passive recipients of knowledge to a student-focused model of collaboration and, and learning customized to the needs of an individual er learner. In fact, there's even a revolution underway in revolutions. The upsurges sweeping the Middle East are, are harbingers of big change. Now, of course, social media didn't cause the Arab Spring. It was caused by injustice. And it didn't create the re these revolutions. They were created by a new generation of, of people, largely young people that wanted hope and didn't want to be treated as subjects anymore. But just as the internet drops transaction and collaboration costs in business, it also drops the cost of rebellion and dissent and even insurrection. So change is in the air like never before, perhaps. I'm enormously hopeful for another reason. You. Uh, your generation has unprecedented power. It's huge. Intelligence. You're the smartest generation ever. And you've got the tools and the will to bring about a new set of institutions. And I'm hopeful that you're up to the challenge. The top of it, you're the graduating class from this year. This is the most diverse global MBA class on the planet. And you've had this intense learning experience. Extraordinary faculty, a magnificent setting. You've debated everything from the global economy to business ethics as part of a community of peers that's probably unlike any other in the world. Over the last year, you had front row seats on today's unprecedented business and societal upheaval, and now you're moving back onto the stage. So what does this mean for you concretely? 
Well, don't get me wrong. I'm not suggesting that we need to become protesters or join an NGO or try and become candidate for the leader of the world or something like that. Rather, each of you will have a role to play in this historic transformation, whether you're an entrepreneur, a consultant, a business executive, an educator, researcher, public sector, um, manager, politician, social innovator, or parent. Change will happen in every home and community and business and school and organization in every nook and cranny of society. It's an opportunity for each of you, if you will it. So let me end by giving you some unconventional wisdom. Seven sibilants to be challenged. Call it the seven imperatives for highly successful business revolutionaries. Number one, don't aspire to be a good manager. As Peter Drucker said years ago, stable times require excellence and good management. As we transition to a new age, our organizations need more. Of course, they need management, but they need leadership. Don't just manage the status quo, lead the change. Think of yourself primarily as a leader, not a manager. Don't simply make improvements to your organization. In the past, tinkering could do the trick. This is a time that requires deep innovation and transformation. Two, don't accept assumptions about the status quo. If it's always been this way, it's probably due for a review. For example, don't accept the way that hierarchies work. Think networks. Understand that talents can now be both inside and exterior to your enterprise. Whether you're running a bank or a fund or a manufacturer or a newspaper, the uniquely qualified minds to accomplish anything may be outside the boundaries of your business. And organizations that harness peer collaboration and new business models will tend to be those that succeed. So, never use the term my people to refer to those you manage, and always emphasize teamwork and knowledge sharing rather than hierarchy. Or if you're in the, in the public sector, don't just deliver good government. Rather, this is a time when we can go beyond the status quo and we can actually reinvent the business of government, the, the sort of way that we orchestrate capability to, to create public value. Open up your government. Create a platform for others to innovate on that. Lead us to a second era of democracy where citizens can be involved. Number three, don't be expedient. Rather, always do the right thing. Build integrity into the DNA of your business. Figure out how to make your firm a, a sustainability leader. Why? Well, lots of reasons. One of them is that green businesses will be lower cost, they're going to perform better, and they'll have better trust and market success. If you can remember this, get your organization to join the Green Exchange. This is a wonderful initiative that's launched by Nike to share intellectual property on sustainable business practices. And if somebody proposes a dicey or questionable initiative, ask yourself, what's the right thing to do? If your organization is facing a public relations crisis, don't hunker down, circle the wagons. Take a page from Johnson & Johnson during the Tylenol crisis. Open up. Transparency is your friend. Perhaps, the, perhaps even radical transparency is it builds trust. Trust, of course, is the sign of unknown of this new network world. And sunlight is the best disinfectant. In fact, just to push this a bit, I even say don't focus on creating shareholder value. Society has created corporations to do more than create wealth for their shareholders or their executives. If you work for and eventually lead a company, understand that companies have multiple stakeholders, including employees, customers, business partners, and the communities within which they operate. The corporate social responsibility people used to have this expression, you do well by doing good. I don't think that was true. For decades, lots of companies did well by being bad, by being monopolies or having terrible labor practices or by externalizing their costs on society. But increasingly, because of transparency, corporations are going to be naked. And as I've been saying for some time now, if you're going to be naked, you better be both. 
fitness is no longer optional. So you need to bake integrity into your bones. And if the financial crisis, by the way, that means that we can all be enormously optimistic that companies are behaving better, not because of government regulation, but because they have to in an open world. And if the financial crisis tells us anything, it's that we live in an interconnected world. You know, in an age where everything and everyone is linked through these vast networks of glass and air, no one, no business, organization, government, agency is an island. We need to do the right thing by all of our stakeholders. And one thing for sure, no organization can succeed in a world that's failing. Number four, don't have work-life balance. Okay, at least in the sense of trying to escape from work so you can have a life. Work should be fun. So make work enjoyable and satisfying for everybody in your organization. Among other reasons, it pays off. In fact, for your generation, I think work and learning and having fun will be the same thing. I was doing a one-day session with a Fortune 20 uh, company and I brought in a panel of new employees. And one executive asked them, what can we do to make our company more attractive to your generation? This young woman got up without missing a beat. She says, uh, well, the first thing we should do is this place should be more fun. It's just not fun to work here. And all these executives are like, what is she talking about? Fun, you know, because my generation has this view that work is work and fun is fun. There's this period in your day where you work and then you go home and you have a martini or something and that's fun. But no, work should be fun, not the chant, not in the sense that it's a big joke or something, but it should be fulfilling and enjoyable. And um, I think your generation has it right. Work should be integrated with learning and it should be enjoyable. I think your generation could put Dilbert out of business and in doing so, transform the nature of work. Number five, don't stop being a student. Take time to develop a strategy for being informed as a citizen. Knowledge is exploding, and you're going to have to commit yourself to a plan for lifelong learning. I really mean this. You know, when I left graduate school, I figured I was set for life. And notwithstanding your great INSEAD degree, today here you're set for about 15 minutes. And you'll need to reinvent your knowledge base multiple times. And as you leave here, I don't think it's what you know that's most important. It's your capacity that you've developed to think, to solve problems, to research, to collaborate with others, to make things happen. Your generation has also got some new challenges about keeping informed in a world where the old ways of doing so, the old media, are collapsing. Yep, the web is a great platform for learning, but don't wait for the news to find you. As much as I love Twitter, you can't be informed in 140 character tweets. And so click on that URL in the, in the tweet and read it. Don't just scan. Spend time every day reading articles from beginning to end. Read points of view that you don't agree with. We need to avoid, because now with the balkanization of media, we can all follow our own point of view. And perhaps end up in these little self-reinforcing echo chambers for the purpose of information is not so much to inform us, but perhaps to uh, give us comfort. I make a point of trying to remember things. You can't count on Google for everything. The process of remembering is tied into the process of creating meaning. Think about how to think and how you will think. Number six, don't just be a student of the world. Take action. Figure out how you can affect this transformation outside of work. So even though it doesn't contribute directly to your immediate prosperity, make a deep commitment to your community or to something, to politics, to an advocacy group. Get organized, and doing so will enrich you and teach your children well about the responsibilities which have to help less fortunate and to improve the state of the world. You're the first ever global generation. So bring your legitimate aspirations and your hope and expectations to the table. And use your NCI network to do this. You forge these lifelong friendships here. You and your dear friends can now have, now have common interests and 
common needs to work together to bring about change. And if you join in with the millions of others from around the world that are doing this, perhaps um, this age of network intelligence that your children inherit might be a better one. Finally, and I'm pushing you here, this may be the toughest one, it's about happiness. And of course we all want it, but when it comes to your own life goals, don't seek happiness per se. With a little luck, happiness will come to you, and deservedly so, but from my experience, happiness is best seen as a byproduct of living a meaningful and a purposeful life. Especially today, I mean, in the decades ahead, you're going to see staggering changes in the world, changes that are unimaginable today. And I think you'll be happier and more fulfilled if you participate fully in these transformations rather than being an observer or a recipient. View happiness as one result of living a good life and of doing the right thing. If luck is the intersection of preparation and opportunity, I have a good feeling that all of you are going to get lucky. You're prepared, as well as can be, and the world is full of opportunity. Endless possibilities for sparkling new approaches to innovation, wealth creation, democracy in every institution in society. This change will be challenging, it will be exhilarating, sometimes agonizing, but if your generation and this class and you don't personally do this, who will? You know, hundreds of years ago, Martin Luther called the printing press God's highest act of grace. Well, today, the communication revolution of your generation has bestowed us with the second act of grace. And you have an historic opportunity to rebuild business and the world. And because each of you can participate in this new renaissance, it's surely an amazing time to be alive. Hopefully you'll each have the wisdom to seize the time, perhaps to build a new cathedral for humanity. Godspeed to each of you. Thank you.